Welcome everyone to, to another TALDB webinar. I'm going to share my screen and present a, a few slides just to set the context. And then I'm going to uh, hand it over to Seth, uh, who's going to show you all the cool stuff that, that we've been working on. All right, so a disclaimer I always put in the pre presentations. So all the credit for all the amazing work uh, that you're going to see today goes to our powerful team. Please visit uh, the, the taldb.com slash about page to see who is uh, who's behind all of this. And as always, I am the exclusive recipient of complaints. So if anything goes wrong, you, you come to me. Um, a few things about who we are in case you haven't uh, attended the, uh, the webinar of ours previously. Uh, Talib is a project that I had started when I was uh, working at Intel Labs and MIT in 2017. Um, it has deep roots at the intersection of high performance computing databases and data science. Uh, we have raised uh, over $20 million. We are we're well capitalized. Uh, we have about 40 members. Uh, we're seeing traction with telecoms, pharmas, uh, hospitals, and other scientific uh, organizations. Here's the agenda uh, for today. These are the features that Seth is going to, to show you in detail how they work and, and the value we're bringing. So you're gonna see everything about unified data management and what we mean by that. You're gonna see Jupyter Notebooks, how you use them on the cloud, um, anything around security and specifically access control sharing and logging. Uh, you're gonna see some amazing scalable serverless compute and how we do it. Um, a lot, several things on machine learning. Uh, dashboards, another cool feature that we haven't announced and you're going to see it for the first time today. And uh, finally, anything around marketplaces and monetization. So I'm going to go through each of those very quickly in my presentation. And again, Seth is going to, uh, to, to dive into uh, each one of those uh, features. Uh, but before I do so, uh, so by the way, all, all you can find all the docs in, in this URL over here and we keep on beefing them up. So please monitor, monitor the docs. We are constantly working on them. Um, but before I delve into the features to explain a little bit the, the, the theoretical background and why we do what we do, um, I want to set the context again, in case you haven't seen what TALDB is and what we do. So here's what you need to know. TALDB is a universal database. And by universal, we mean that we handle all data types. This is in contrast to other databases we can handle, which can handle only tables or only documents, only key values. We do everything. It will go even beyond what you have seen in databases, like we store images, video, and uh, and many other data types. Um, the database is, itself is based on, on multi-dimensional arrays. This is extremely powerful, and I'm going to show you how uh, how they look like. Uh, we have numerous uh, APIs and integrations. Talib is very interoperable, and Talib works everywhere. It, it can work on cloud object stores, but it can work on very fast uh, distributed file systems uh, on, on your premises. There are two Talib offerings. There is the TalDB embedded storage engine, and this is open source. I'm going to touch upon this briefly today. Uh, but the, the, the previous webinar was uh, dedicated to TalDB embedded. If you're interested in knowing the mechanics of, of the storage engine, please look for that. Um, you can find it on our website. And of course, TalDB Cloud, which is the, the actual database. And I, I'm going to explain the, the differences in a bit. So uh, this, this uh, uh, today's webinar is on TalDB Cloud. <clears throat> so here's how we build the universal database and where the, the offerings, um, uh, how the offerings get, uh, get uh, uh, integrated together. So at the very bottom, imagine any kind of file system, it could be an object store, it could be something else. And at the very top, your favorite tool or your favorite programming language, it could be anything, it could be SQL, it could be SQL database, it could be Python, Python API, an R API could be anything. At the very bottom, we have TALDB embedded. This is what we presented in the previous webinar. And it's all about storing and accessing arrays. It's the format, it's open source, it's on GitHub. It has a lot of cool features. And then TALDB Cloud is the actual database which works as a, as a service on the cloud or on premises. We're gonna show you how it works on the cloud as a SaaS, but you can install and deploy everything locally. But this is what brings the other cool features like the security, authentication, access control, um, any kind of automation around serverless compute at scale, any kind um, of uh, uh, work that you can do on uh, Jupyter notebooks and dashboards that you can create. So a lot of cool things that we will present today. And of course, we do the integrations with all the tools and we continue to add uh, some very exciting integrations. These are non-trivial because we're all for performance, but we take care of these. Like we, we have teams that work dedicated on, on the integrations uh, between TalDB and those tools. 
So what is Tallyb embedded? Again, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes explaining the storage engine because the rest of the presentation is going to be on the um, on the on the Tallyb cloud part. So Tallyb embedded is an embeddable C++ library at its core uh, that stores and accesses multi-dimensional arrays. And multi-dimensional arrays look like this. I'm not going to get into too much detail. Again, you can find all this stuff on the website and in the previous webinar. But this is the data structure. And what we're telling you is that this data structure can capture everything. Images, LiDAR, genomics, tables, anything you can imagine. And this engine uh, supports very fast array slicing. Like we have put a lot of sophistication in the software to make this slicing work extremely fast. And this is at the core of every algorithm that you can, you can think of or that you can develop in the future. So a very, very powerful piece of software. Here are the features at the glance of Talib Embedded, and you can find it on, on GitHub over here in this address. Um, it has excellent performance. It's built in C++, it's columnar, it's multi-threaded, it has excellent indexing. Uh, it uh, supports rapid updates and versioning, so time traveling, uh, schema evolution. So a lot of a lot of different features there that are uh, vital for, for data management. Uh, it has extreme interoperability, as I mentioned before, and it's very, very optimized for the cloud. So if, if you prefer cloud storage, TalDB is a very, very competitive solution. All right, so this is the context. This is uh, what we're doing as a company and, and the core function and, and the core basis of, uh, of TalDB Cloud. But here are the features that we're going to cover today on, Tal on the TalDB Cloud front. So first comes unified data management. So everything in TalDB Cloud is an array. <clears throat> everything is stored as an array. That, that, that's the, the power of this data structure. Uh, so any kind of data, you can combine AIS data with uh, SAR data, for example. You can combine gen genomic variants with clinical records, you can, any kind of data, but also code, code in the form of notebooks, user-defined functions, dashboards, or even ML models. Everything is stored in TalDB. Seth is going to show you, you know, how we can manage everything in a single platform. Um, you can also see that we have catalogs. You, you, you don't need to create your own relational database to just keep metadata. Like all the metadata, all the descriptions, the entire catalog, the exploration is done in a single platform. Anything around access control, anything around uh, logging. So you will see how easy it is to govern everything on, on TalDB Cloud. So a single UI or a single platform for everything. And by the way, everything is accessible via REST. So you can either use a UI or you can use everything programmatically. The second things are the notebooks. Uh, Seth is going to show you that you can spin up Jupyter notebooks very, very easily on the cloud without any configuration, without thinking about how to spin up machines on the cloud. Um, you can launch different types. You can do the notebook management. Remember, uh, notebooks are arrays, and therefore you can do everything. Catalogs, metadata, descriptions, exploration, everything that you would otherwise do with data, you can do with notebooks as well and you know, access control, logging, all, all of that stuff. So notebooks give you a very easy way to onboard yourself, to test, to spin up some massive computations without you know, uh, bearing the cost of latency and whatnot from your laptop to the cloud, because the, the notebook is spun up directly in the cloud. Another massive feature of Tally being we put a lot of sophistication here as well, is anything around like, an authentication, security, and sharing and logging, which are uh, uh, um, two extremely uh, extremely important features. So with this feature, you can share your work with anybody in the world, not just your organization, but cross organizations or with the public, with millions of people, it doesn't matter. Um, we support this massive catalog of everything that is happening in, the, in public or in private. So all this is done by TalDB Cloud. Um, we have a massive catalog with runnable code. You can share code, but not in the way that you do it with GitHub. You can share functions that are runnable. You don't need to deploy anything. You don't need to, to install anything. You just register a function and any user can just tweak the inputs and that's it. It's going to work. Um, you can have, of course, organizations. Um, and the most important thing that I want to note here is that our whole infrastructure is serverless, managed by us on, on, on the SaaS front. This is important because if you want to share some data that you curated and that is very, very important with a million people, you don't need to build your own infrastructure to service a million people simultaneously. TalDB Cloud does that for you. 
You just prepare your data, you register the data, and then you're gone. That's it. TalDB is gonna is gonna take care of everything, all the all the requests, all the scaling, all the elasticity, all of that stuff. So this promotes collaboration and reproducibility, and it takes it to the next level, right? You don't need to build your own infrastructures to service the entire world. Then anything that we do uh, on, um, in the compute on the compute front is serverless, and this is because most people don't really know their workloads. They don't know they need 10 machines or 100 machines. So we have a way for you to create, you know, to do everything in a serverless manner, like slicing or SQL. Um, you can perform functions in a serverless manner, task graphs, so that you can scale your computation, or you can create pipelines, you can share all of that. And again, it, it's serverless in the sense that you don't need to specify a cluster. If TalDB thinks that your tasks need to be deployed in a, on a thousand machines, they're gonna, it's gonna deploy them on a thousand machines. And then in the next step, if only one machine is needed, then you're gonna use only one machine. So it's, it's very, very good for workloads that, you know, sometimes they have a stage which is embarrassingly parallel and some other stages that are not embarrassingly parallel. Um, it's geo-aware in the sense that when a query comes to TalDB Cloud, and we, we parse the query on the TalDB cloud side, and we understand which region, for example, on S3, your data resides. And based on that, we send the compute to a cluster we maintain in that region. And that reduces latencies, and egress costs, and so on and so forth. So it becomes faster and cheaper. And again, based on what I told you on the previous slide, you, you don't need infrastructure to share data and code. Everything is done by TalDB Cloud. You don't own clusters. You don't specify clusters. You, there are no dedicated clusters. We have thousands of machines running, working at all times, and we, we deploy the computation to those machines. So anything around automation, scalability, and uh, a lot of cost savings, th these are the things that we do with our serverless compute feature. All right, so on the machine learning front, uh, we store and version all the machine learning models again as arrays, and you can store that along with your data. You don't need one database for the data and a completely different service for your machine learning models. Because how are you going to orchestrate? How are you, how are you going to, um, to impose access policies and all of that? So TalDB Cloud unifies that. Um, again, you get the catalogs, the descriptions, the metadata, the sharing, the logging, all of that stuff. And you can scale your training or the servicing of your models based on what I described in the previous slides. So something to note, I keep on saying that machine learning is a data management problem. It's not a compute problem. And since in our world, it's a data management problem, machine learning must be integrated with the data solution. That's exactly what we're doing with TalDB Cloud. Another exciting feature that Seth is going to present is dashboards. You effectively can create any dashboard uh, using Python widgets, R Shiny, or any other uh, application. And dashboards in the TalDB world are notebooks, and notebooks are arrays. So dashboards are arrays. And you can launch an, a, a dashboard with a, with a single click super easily, as if it is a notebook, inside the UI and render it. And then, of course, you can share it, log it, and monetize it, because it's an array. So anything we build on arrays gets inherited by dashboards, and of course, by notebooks. So you can really diversify your visualization options with software you built or with software, software that somebody else built and they just made it public or shared it with you. Finally, we believe that the concept of the marketplace should not be standalone. It should never be a separate service where you buy data from or code from and then you download terabytes of data only for you to, to have to build a different infrastructure to store and manage the data again, and also replicate the data. Imagine if you're selling, I don't know, AIS data to a thousand customers and a thousand customers have to download the same, I don't know, hundred terabytes and store the same hundred terabytes of data in different forms on the cloud. This, this is super cumbersome. So TalDB has a full marketplace integrated with Stripe in the platform. It's not a separate platform. You can monetize everything. You monetize everything in a pay as you go fashion. We have multiple different models. You can license the data outside of TalDB Cloud or inside super easily. 
And again, zero infrastructure for data and code vendors. You don't have to build the infrastructure only because you have some amazing, super viable data sets that you want to share and sell to the world. And no more wrangling, no more deploying of the code. Everything is done completely automatically. So this is a game changer for marketplaces. And today we get to show it to you, but hopefully in the future, you're gonna see what we do with some of our, of our big partners. All right, so this is my, my last slide. Um, so as a summary, at least for, from my end, so why Tally Cloud uh, based on these features? Well, here's the value proposition, just in case this resonates with one of your use cases. So far, we have been doing everything very horizontally, but in, the, in, in subsequent webinars, you're gonna see more vertical, more targeted use cases. But here is, here's the high level idea. So first, a single solution for data storage and analysis, regardless of what kind of data you have. So it unifies data management in terms of, you know, the different types of data, as well as machine learning and visualizations and notebooks and so on and so forth. Um, this single platform uh, harmonizes security, super important, right? Like how are you going to orchestrate access co control in two completely different systems? Um, and of course, the, the, the computation that you can have inside this platform, you don't have one, one platform for storage, one for compute, you combine in a single solution. The other thing that you get is better performance and at a lower cost. And a big part of it is because of the format and the storage engine. We, we, we store everything as arrays for a reason. The reason is performance. And everything we do is serverless. It scales very gracefully. It's pay as you go. It's geo aware. So a lot of performance, a lot of cost reductions. And again, zero infrastructure for data vendors, right? So you don't have to spend money in order to distribute your data anymore. So this reduces the cost by, by a crazy amount. And finally, and this is the honestly the, the most important to me, I have said that in, in other talks that I give, I want to promote the creativity and brilliance of the users, not just of the software that we are building. And TalDB Cloud does exactly that. With the creation of the data sets, of the notebooks, of the functions, of the pipelines, of the dashboards, of the ML models, you get to create you and you get to share with others and you get to collaborate with with the entire world and you can build pretty much anything so this is for me uh please note that we're always hiring so this is the address where you can find our resources with that thank you and uh, seth take, take it away. away thank you stavers i'm going to go ahead and share my screen to start a walkthrough going to take probably about 45 uh, to 50 minutes to try to leave us some time for Q&A at the end. As several mentioned, everything I'm about to show you uh, is in our SaaS product, tiled to be um, cloud, the hosted version that we have at cloud at tiled to be So anyone uh, can sign up and follow along with what I'm doing. Um, also, the demonstrations that I'll show will be made available with direct links um, after the webinar. Uh, so you can follow along afterwards also. But it's important to note that every single feature I'm about to show you is available for on-premise use um, also. So there's nothing special about the SaaS product. We're not locked into anything on Amazon or Azure or anything like that. Everything can be deployed and usable um, from your own clusters. In addition to that, um, everything that I'm showing you today, of course, is going to be mostly through the web interface. But as several mentioned, we have REST APIs available for everything. So not just the direct data access, but even the listing page that I'm on here for data management um, is available via programmatic APIs. So it's very easy to work Tile to be Cloud into any type of environment you have um, directly from the website, or if you have a requirement to, uh, to hit some of the APIs programmatically, um, perhaps maybe some of the audit or login APIs, all of that is available to you. To get started with, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the data management, some of the data management features that we have um, in Tile to be Cloud. Then I'm going to move into some of our uh, sharing and collaboration um, with the notebooks, um, and then some of the actual computations that we offer um, in the system here. Um, finally, uh, as several mentioned, I will highlight a little bit around the, uh, the dashboards and, uh, and a sneak peek at our uh, machine learning models and some of the details around, around that. So in TileDB Cloud, what we're viewing right now is the arrays that are owned by myself or, uh, or the TileDB organization that I'm a part of. And right off the bat, we can see that TileDB has a very large and diverse uh, data set. So when we talk about, about it being universal and storing different types of data, 
Um, we truly mean it. And you can see it right here. We have some uh, VCF data from 1000 Genomes Project. It's about 70 gigs in size. We have a LIDAR data set from the Boulder, Colorado, uh, a little, little less than a gig in size. Uh, we have some uh, taxi data from the New York City um, taxi um, data set that a, a lot of you might be familiar with from the, from the SQL world, very popular there. We'll actually talk a little bit about the, the, the taxi data in some of our demos later. Um, and then, of course, we, we also have some additional LIDAR um, from the New Jersey data that comes in about 51 gigs. So you can see we're, we're all across different domains um, with a lot of different data types available in the system. And it's very easy to not only see the arrays that, are, that, that belong to you, but I can also flip over and see anything that's been shared with me directly. So uh, one of our partners, Exact Earth, uh, has shared a couple of different arrays, so I can see some of that data. I can see some data that Stavros has shared with me and some other employees. Um, it's very easy to come in here and, uh, and look for that. We also have, um, as you would imagine, in, a, in any type of data management platform, very easy to, uh, to search um, by keywords, by category, hashtags, um, all of that functionality is available. We have advanced filtering capabilities. So, you know, by and large, everything you expect from a modern website we support, and this really will help you with your data management. As your data grows and the number of arrays grow, we make it very easy to group the arrays, catalog them, uh, and work, it, work them through the system. So let's look at one particular array um, real quick to touch on some of the individual features um, that are here. Um, I'm going to highlight just a couple items and we'll leave some things for, for later on in the webinar. But the first thing I wanna show right off the bat is uh, we provide a lot of data management aspects directly for you as the user. Um, some of it programmatic, some of it human readable. So for instance, you can see we have a very nice markdown description that you can have in the system. This is full markdown. Uh, think like GitHub README style. You can have images, tables, embed whatever you'd like, links um, through the system here, very easy to do. Um, we also have you know, the high level details of the array, uh, the size, what type, what permissions do you have? In this case, I'm the administrator of this array. So I have a little bit extra information uh, compared to uh, a read only user. Uh, if uh, one of you log in, uh, look at this data from the public perspective, you're gonna see a little bit less information. And that's because everything in Tile to the Cloud revolves around role-based access controls. And we take access very seriously. So every little detail uh, we coordinate with should it be made available to users of different permission levels. Now, in this case, because I'm an admin, this allows me to see some additional information such as the actual S3 location. So this array is stored on S3 in a particular bucket. Now as an end user, we abstract that away. You would only ever use the TileDB URI that we provide over here. So if you wanna access the array, you use the TileDB URI. But of course, as an administrator, you're gonna to wanna to know like what's the actual bucket, where is it stored? And so we provide that information to you. And it's also important to note that in this case, it's stored on S3, but this just as easily could be an Azure Blob Store, Google Cloud Storage. Uh, for enterprise users, this could be a shared file system like LustreFS or NFS mounts. Um, a lot of flexibility where the data is actually stored in the system. And of course, we have the, uh, the category hashtags, as I mentioned. Um, we also provide the array schema available at a very high level uh, for a quick overview. So you can you know, see what are the filters, or what are the compression used, what are the dimensions and the attributes and all the different date times uh, available in the system. Um, for those that are not quite familiar with arrays, you can think of this like a show create table in, uh, in a traditional SQL database, it provides all the, the, the details you would need to figure out how to query the data itself. Now, in addition to the schema, we also show the array metadata. So tile to be uh, arrays allow you to attach arbitrary key value metadata to the array itself. Um, this is very powerful. So you don't actually have to store that metadata somewhere else. A lot of times people use Excel spreadsheets or another SQL database to try to store this, kind, this uh, arbitrary metadata that's associated with the data set. Tile to be lets you store it directly on the array. And then of course, in the UI here, we render it live, uh, live for you. Uh, you can have strings, uh, date times, integer values, anything could be supported uh, for the keys and, and, and the values here. So a, a lot of flexibility is offered in the system. Now we have a couple other items uh, around pricing, sharing, and, and the activity logs, but I'm gonna leave those for a deep dive uh, in just a few minutes uh, of the UI. The important thing that I wanna highlight next though is that everything in TileDB Cloud is actually stored as an array. So the basic functionality that I've just showed you is available for everything, notebooks, user-defined functions, dashboards, and even the machine learning models. So if we take a look at a, at a notebook, um, for instance, we'll just open up uh, with a quick start serverless one. You're gonna notice all of the same functionality exists. Uh, you'll have the description, a full markdown description that's available, um, the permissions, uh, licensing of, uh, of the data, um, or the notebook in this case, your category hashtags. You have the same uh, tabs around sharing, activity, settings. 
Um, but there are, are a few differences that we have when it comes to the notebooks, uh, UDFs, and dashboards, um, because again, they are uh, a little bit more than just data themselves. So for notebooks, we actually have a very nice uh, preview functionality available in the system. So this lets you uh, link this notebook out to users, uh, make it available to the public at large. Uh, anyone can then come uh, or a coworker of yours can come, take a look at the notebook. They can view it re uh, rendered here uh, very nicely. Um, output is, is rendered. Um, and if they decide that they're interested in this notebook, um, you can simply click the launch button. And if you click launch, this is going to take you into a dedicated environment where this notebook will actually, uh, this actually works. We'll do that in just half a second here to, to show the functionality. But we also have the uh, download button here and I just wanna highlight. So everything entirely to be cloud is owned by you, the user. So this data is actually stored in an S3 bucket. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that storage actually works in just a second, but it's stored in your own S3 bucket um, where you have full access. Um, but we also make it very easy for you to download this notebook uh, directly to your laptop uh, if you want to modify it locally, and then you can always uh, re-upload it live. Um, a lot of flexibility in what we offer here. So if you decide you want to actually launch this notebook, you can simply click the launch button. And what actually happens right now is we are spinning up a dedicated environment just for you for, uh, for the Jupyter Lab instance. Um, the notebook settings and parameters are pre-configured for this notebook. So when a notebook is created, um, we record the environment that is there what image type, what, uh, what server sizes are used. We'll talk a little bit about how that actually works in just a second. Um, and then, so when the user comes back, uh, wants to launch it, everything's pre-configured. You don't have to worry about which environment do you need? Is this a geospatial notebook? Is this a basic one? Is it genomics? Everything will be taken care of for you. So it makes it very easy to, uh, to share and collaborate uh, with the notebooks uh, here in the environment. So when you launch directly into JupyterLab, um, you are presented with a JupyterLab environment that is going to be very familiar to anyone that's used this uh, in the open source world. We pretty much run uh, the open source JupyterLab with a few, uh, few extensions added to it. So we have an extension, of course, to actually store the, tile D, the notebooks as TileDB arrays. So we have a content plugin that we've built that lets you actually store this, this TileDB, uh, this notebook as a TileDB array backed by an S3 bucket uh, in the TileDB format. So you get all the functionality uh, inherited by TileDB. You get time traveling support. So you can actually go back in time, see what the notebook was like a week ago. Um, and with our multi-reader, multi-writer, that means you have a collaborative environment. So I could be in this notebook running it. And at the same time, Stavros could also be making modifications, but we won't step on each other's toes because TileDB natively supports handling uh, the multi-reader um, environments here. Also in the JupyterLab environment uh, that we have hosted here, you do get two gigs of persistent storage space uh, as a scratch space, so to speak, if you want to maybe render an output image or, or, or develop some things for testing. Um, but we do make it very simple and easy for you to create the notebook yours itself as a Tile to be Cloud notebook. So you can simply um, go to new launcher and we have a notebook item here for Tile to be notebook, click notebook. It opens up a little dialogue and you can pick all the options. You know, what should the notebook uh, be called? What's the S3 path? Of course, we let you set defaults for all of these. So I have a default S3 path here and your credentials that you could set. Um, and the owner, of course, uh, much like GitHub and GitLab and other systems, TileDB has organizations and we let you, when you create assets, uh, pick who owns it, right? Do I own it? Does my organization own it? Um, and go from there. And this makes it very simple and easy. You can also pick the kernel. So of course we have Python notebooks, but we also have Bash, R, Julia, and other environments coming up soon. I'm gonna create this as a Python notebook. So if I, when I create this, what's actually happening is the basic notebook is created in JupyterLab just like normal, but the actual backing is gonna be this S3 path and it's registered and created in TileDB Cloud where you're gonna get all the functionality um, envisioned in TileDB Cloud. So if I just, um, as a quick example, just print out hello, um, and I run that, and then if I save it, we're actually able to go over to the notebooks uh, tab once the, the savings finished here. And we can see my example notebook and you'll have all the information available to you live. You can see the details. I could add the description, the licensing, all that type of information, but you see the, uh, the images created, uh, the server profiles automatically selected. And of course, the preview with that, uh, that single command and the output is available right there. So this makes it very, very simple and easy for you to create notebooks live in the environment to work and collaborate with your coworkers. So once you have the data in TileDB, of course, you want to explore and we make it very easy for you to come in and, and do that. Now, when I launched directly into the notebook, we, uh, we skipped over um, the actual launching step. So let me show you exactly how that works. If I shut down my notebook here, um, will take me back to the launch screen. 
And in Tile to be Cloud, we have a few pre-configured environments for you with a variety of packages uh, that are most, most commonly used by uh, people uh, data science in the different domains, whether it's geospatial, whether it's genomics. Um, and then of course, uh, a few different server profiles um, for you to pick from. So if we, uh, if we give it a second here, it'll take me back to the, uh, to the launch screen. And so when you select your image, again, like I say, we have three different ones uh, pre-configured in our SaaS environment, but of course, enterprise users uh, are able to customize this. You can have custom images. Um, we, of course, are always listening for feedback on the installed packages and the variety that's available here. But we have a basic one for data science, one for genomics, uh, one for geospatial with different server profiles, a small one, which uh, mimics kind of more or less a laptop with available resources works really well with our serverless computations, which we'll highlight uh, in just a moment. And also uh, a large one, if you're trying to run something local in your notebook, um, you're doing a little experimentation, you wanna test locally, we do provide that large resource. Uh, one thing I wanna to note too is coming up very shortly here, we're also gonna have the ability to have GPUs attached to notebooks. Um, so as we talk about machine learning uh, in just a moment, uh, we're building out the GPU functionality to accelerate uh, all of that. So, when you have your notebook environments, uh, like I mentioned, very easy to collaborate, but how do you actually collaborate with that? Let's take a look at the New York City taxi data once again, but I want to highlight the sharing capabilities this time that are built into tile to be cloud So we have the sharing tab that makes it very easy um, for anyone to come in the system and share. So I simply click share with, I could type someone such as Stavros, I give him permissions, I can say read only, I click share and he instantly gets access to this array um, with whatever permissions I've given him. As the owner of the data, I did not have to manage IAM roles. I did not have to manage S3 bucket policies. I had to simply just select him uh, from the list and, uh, and send them an invite. Of course, you can also invite by email address or organizations as a whole. So this makes it super, super easy and powerful to collaborate and share with anybody in the system without managing the underlying file system access. Uh, I think we all know how difficult uh, S3 bucket policies are. Uh, it seems like once a month, some bank uh, makes a mistake and releases a bunch of our credit card information through S3 policies. So we wanted to uh, have TileDB make it super easy to share and collaborate. We have our own access control system that we've built into the system that facilitates all of this. So what actually happens here when the data is shared? If Stavros now came in to access this array, what actually happens is he talks to TileDB Cloud. Uh, for all of his querying, whether it's Python slicing, whether it's serverless SQL, whether it's running uh, uh, from Spark or Dask, it doesn't matter how you interface with it. He'll talk directly to Tile to be Cloud. Tile to be Cloud then, on his behalf, will securely access the underlying data that's stored, whether it's on S3, Azure, or some other file system. Stavros would never actually get direct access to the data. Tile to be Cloud facilitates everything, and all of it goes through the the, the Tile to be Cloud system. Uh, here. And if you want to revoke access, whether it's to a user organization or whatnot, simply click the revoke button and Stavros instantly loses access to the data. So this makes it super simple and easy to uh, keep a list of who's got access and manage it directly here in the UI. Now, of course, with sharing comes the, the audit log and the activity. So just as I, uh, as I shared with him, we make it super easy and simple to view all of the activity of the array. Um, here we can view the activity at a very high level summary of what's going on. You can see queries that were performed um, and a link over to the task. The task will have the specific details such as the programming language, what ranges were accessed, what attributes, if it was a SQL query, uh, perhaps the, the SQL statement, if it was a UDF, um, the text there. We will take a look uh, into tasks uh, a little bit when we go through the computations. Now, I showed sharing with an individual user, but we also make it very easy to share the data publicly or privately. From the settings page, you control all the details of the array itself. I can make the array read only, for instance. This is very uh, great if it's a public example. Um, you don't want anyone to modify it accidentally, um, including maybe your own employees or internal users. Um, you can also modify the array, make it private or public. So you simply click, uh, click this and you can swap the settings back and forth. It makes it very easy to manage all of this. Of course, we have the, uh, the categorization, the hashtags, the descriptions, the licensing, all of that uh, going forward. All right, so from, the, from all the details here that I've showed you, every single thing uh, works no matter where you are. 
So I'm going to launch a notebook and we'll actually do some computations. And then we will actually run the same thing for my laptop just to show you that everything's available in the system. I'm going to launch a geospatial notebook uh, as we'll show you some geospatial dashboards in just a few minutes. Now, once again, when you're in the notebook environment, uh, everything you do here and all the activity gets logged back over in the, uh, the array activity and the tasks. And we will show the details of that in just, uh, just a moment. The notebook environments are not the only place, as I mentioned, that you can run um, the computations. The same notebook that I'm going to show you now uh, is also available uh, for you guys to download, and you can run it from your local uh, laptops. Um, the advantage of the hosted environment is that all the packages are pre-installed. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you that have used Jupyter know one of the most difficult parts uh, is, first off, sharing the notebooks. How do you get from the people? Do you commit it to GitHub? Do you send it in emails? But then the second part is giving people a dedicated environment with the right packages installed. You can use Conda environments, you can use Docker files, but all of these are just additional uh, hurdles that people have to jump over um, to get into the environment. So in the hosted environment here, we have a large list of packages pre-installed, um, including all the basic ones for data science, machine learning, uh, the, the domain specific ones in, G, um, in geospatial and genomics such as GDAL and, and, and Poodle. This allows you to have uh, one stop shop for you to collaborate with, uh, with your coworkers or, uh, or um, people on the internet at large without having to worry about the dedicated environments to spin up. All right, so let's take a look at this serverless uh, quick start example. It's gonna walk you through the basics of querying and the computations that we have in the system. So we're gonna import a couple packages here, TileDB, NumPy, Pandas, and of course, Matplotlib for some nice plotting. Now, the most basic way that you can access the data is simply with our Python API very similar to the open source software that uh, many of you guys uh, might have used, you can simply call tiledb.open, pass it a string of the array URI, and then query it with any of our accessors. In this case, I'm gonna get it as a pandas data frame returned right here. And so once again, I'm gonna use the tiledb URI. I'm not accessing things on the underlying S3 path or Azure blob store. Everything's gonna go through tiledb cloud um, and then shared. And of course, this will work with any of our APIs, R, C++, C Sharp, Java, you name it. In addition to just basic querying, though, we also have a number of serverless computations, and these are really where the platform starts to, to shine, is the ability to take your, take your query or your computation and push it into the service. So here's a basic example of a SQL query. Um, what you want to do here is simply give us the string of the SQL query, and we support full ANSI SQL because we're using uh, our storage engine that we've built with MariaDB on the back end. This query will then be run in TileDB Cloud inside a containerized environment where we run, um, run your query in a secure manner, the results then are serialized and returned directly to your client. Um, so you can use any type of SQL query you would expect here. I'm just using a simple extract, but we also support advanced uh, uh, queries. Like I say, it's ANSI SQL. So you could have a common table expression. You could use window functions. You can use aggregations, uh, pretty much anything you name it. You can have parameters. You can do joins if you want it. You have full flexibility in what you do here. Um, and the data that you get back, you get back in a number of, uh, of different um, capabilities. So first and foremost, you can, of course, get the data back um, in a pandas data frame in Python. You can also get the data back in Apache Arrow form and JSON. And JSON makes it very easy for you to actually use our serverless SQL queries directly from our JavaScript API, building out websites live from the environment. So when you get, uh, when you get into the, uh, the notebook here, um, you get a pandas data frame back and you can plot it. See, um, and you can do all the visualizations you would like in the environment. Full support for any, anything you'd like to do. In addition to the serverless SQL, we also have the user-defined functions. User-defined functions allow you to run arbitrary Python or R functions with other language coming up soon uh, in TileDB Cloud. So you simply define a function. In this case, just a simple example, which is going to print hello and then uh, whatever string you pass it. And when you call uh, execute on the UDF, what's actually happening here is we serialize your Python function. We send it to TileDB Cloud. We include any parameters that are needed um, in the function. And then again, inside a Dockerized, containerized sandbox environment, we run your function, pass in the parameters that it wants, and return your data directly to, uh, to you here. In this case, uh, you can simply see that, you know, hello, Seth, uh, comes back. I'm using my uh, uh, username here. But this supports any number of parameters uh, and anything you want. The R functionality works very similar. You can define arbitrary functions in R. Uh, arbitrary parameters are supported. can be sent, uh, and results returned directly, directly to you. Now, in addition to just arbitrary functions, you can actually also run a function directly on an array itself. So with TileDB Cloud, 
This allows you to build out and push your computation to the service instead of extracting your data to the client. So in this case, I'm going to have a, a simple example uh, where I'll take a single array um, data going to be uh, shipped in here, but this could also work for multiple arrays. So if you want to do some sort of custom join algorithm or custom linear algebra, linear algebra across different um, or multiple arrays, you can actually support a UDF on multiple arrays too. Um, and then I'm simply going to return um, the monthly ridership of the multiplier. Now, when I call apply, same thing happens as before. The function itself is serialized, shipped to the service. Then in the service, everything is run there in a containerized environment. But the important thing to note is when you actually apply it on one or more arrays, we have a lot of optimizations we've done about querying the array in parallel and passing the data directly into the environment to, uh, to optimize and, and streamline the latency to actually perform everything in parallel. The results are then returned directly to the user here. So everything happens uh, in as massive parallelization as we can. And we support a number of different APIs and permutations on the APIs in both Python, R, and JavaScript of how you can actually call these functions. So we have a base function where you can pass the URI. We also have an apply function. So no matter how, what you're familiar with and what ecosystem you're familiar with, we have, uh, we have integrations that look very similar to that. Now, you can also register a function in TileDB Cloud. So um, besides just running it live and having to carry that definition with you, I could actually register the example function. I'm going to just call it uh, example uh, registration. And then that lets you invoke it by name. So when I uh, invoke it by name, again, we grab the registered code, we bring it into your containerized environment, and then we run it with the results uh, returned directly to you, uh, the user here. So in addition, and there we go. And in addition to, uh, to just the basics of UDFs and serverless SQL, everything can be built up into what we call task graphs. So running arbitrary functions uh, is useful but most likely you're gonna have a complex workflow that you wanna build out in the system. So we allow you to handle this um, directly in, um, in TileDB with the task graphs. Um, this allows you to mix arbitrary functions. It could be a SQL parameter, it could be array UDFs, it could even be across languages. If you'd like to mix an R function with a SQL fu function or R with a Python, all of that's capable. So in this case, I'm gonna build out a delayed SQL object. So all of our task graphs work around what we call the delayed APIs. Um, if you've used uh, promises and futures in Python, these are going to work very similar to that. So again, I'm just going to pass it a SQL query because I'm comfortable in SQL. I like to run my, my queries there. Um, and then I'm also going to define a linear regression that's just going to use uh, SciPy to perform a basic linear regression over the SQL query that I selected. And then I'll return the data um, directly to me here. So if we visualize this, this is the most basic task graph, just two basic nodes. We're going to run the SQL query and then the linear regression. And when we call compute, What's happening is the SQL query is going to run first, and then the results from that are going to automatically be passed into our linear regression function, um, and then the results returned here. And if we perform a simple plot, we'll see the nice output of this linear regression. So this is the most basic example, but I think you guys can probably see that the capabilities here are near limitless. So if we actually look at a little more advanced use case, we can build out arbitrarily large task graphs that support any number of, of direct acyclic graphs. In this case, I'm going to have a large tree of just some arbitrary functions um, that sleep for this example. And when we run it, once again, uh, by calling compute, everything here is going to uh, be run in parallel. So we can watch the graph update live, and we'll see each stage of the graph run in parallel, and then the computations uh, completely go in, in synchronous. And when you have a large graph like this, you don't have to worry about what size cluster do I need, what's the environment that needs to be spun up, how many nodes do you need. Tile to be cloud facilitates running everything here. And actually the graph ran quite quick, uh, so quick that the, uh, the visualization didn't actually have a chance to, uh, to run live. We'll show you some other visualizations in a moment. But all of this is handled by Tile to be cloud automatically. So we spin up the cluster, we scale it. We have automatic retry support built into the platform, built into the clients. Different error cases can be handled. If there's not enough resources, things will, uh, will retry once there is enough resources. So Tile to be cloud facilitates all of the elasticity around, um, around the data management aspects. Um, I'm sorry, around the computational aspects, without you having to, again, worry about the cluster or the idle compute that comes with managing large clusters. Now, I want to walk you through an actual live example of loading data uh, through tile to be cloud um, using our serverless computations. So what we're going to do here is use the New York City taxi data that we've uh, looked at an array of earlier. 
Um, but we're going to load about four years worth of data from 2016 to 2020, about four and a half years of data that, um, that they have in the taxi system. And we're going to use the task graphs to load all of this in parallel um, in direct sequence. So I'm going to uh, import some packages again. I'm going to uh, define some details. So where do I want this array to be stored? So everything entitled to be cloud, um, again, is actually backed by a bucket that, that you, the user, own. Um, we don't do the data hosting itself uh, in the SaaS product. Everything's going to be owned by you, the user. Of course, for enterprise users, you have a lot of flexibility there. So I'm going to define an S3 bucket uh, location that I have access to, which I've pre-configured my credentials uh, in the environment. We'll walk through a little bit about um, that in just a few minutes. So I define where I'm going to actually store this data. And next, I'm going to define some details about the CSVs I'm loading. Now, the New York City taxi data is a great data set, very large and easy to, to, uh, to show um, in different benchmarks. But it's not the most clean data set. Of course, as you can imagine, over the years, they've changed the headers, they've changed the columns, they've changed the data types. So we're going to define a, a couple of helper functions here um, to look at a subset of the data, including uh, the headers that we care about from the array, um, the data types of the different ones. We're going to just go ahead and set them, um, and then uh, uh, some other helper functions. Now, we're just going to take a look at one of the helper functions, um, and then we'll, we'll move on uh, to the rest. All the different years and schemas have slightly different helper functions. As you guys know, when you're dealing with uh, this raw data, it needs a little bit of cleaning sometimes. But we're going to actually use some of our integrations with Apache Arrow to read the data from a, in Apache Arrow form, um, and then store that directly in TileDB in a very optimized fashion. So first off, um, we're going to actually open the CSV with the TileDB VFS API. So TileDB has a virtual file system built into the open source that allows us to access arbitrary files on arbitrary backends, whether it's Azure, Blob Store, HDFS, S3. And, the, and in Python, we mimic the Python file um, IO API. So we can actually open the, the CSV file that the New York uh, City um, stores on S3 with VFS and then use it as if it was a, a local Python function directly, a Python file. Um, we're gonna define the, uh, the, the column list that we need for Arrow. Um, we're going to define some helper functions um, for the arrow reading and the conversion, including, again, the list of all the different data types. We're going to fix the data types um, since we, uh, we're just looking at a subset of the data here. Um, then, you know, we simply uh, open the array with arrow using the CSV opener. Uh, we'll do it in a chunked form just to show that it's possible. All the permutations are possible, especially with TileDB integration with arrow. So we'll get uh, the data back in, uh, in arrow chunks. Um, have a little bit of timing so we can show you the output and the different times that, uh, that exist there. Um, we'll convert the chunk into a pandas data frame just for simplicity of showing some of the output. Uh, and then we will uh, just store that, that arrow backed pandas data directly in TileDB by calling TileDB from pandas. So this makes it very, very easy to just open the CSV and read it. Now, we don't have to use Apache Arrow to do this. You can use pandas. And of course, actually, TileDB supports reading from CSV files directly too. But for the verbosity of the webinar, we wanted to show some of our integrations with Apache Arrow here. So we'll go ahead and run, uh, load these functions. We also have one for the, the, the different schemas. Like I say, 2017 has a slightly different schema, and on 2019 and forward has a slightly different schema. Now, the first thing we do before we'll actually load all of this is create the array itself. So I'm going to define the array ahead of time with it, some of the parameters that I know about. Again, this data set is not the most clean, so I'm going to have a little bit of uh, verbosity in what I, uh, what I allow here for the simplicity of the demo. So I'm gonna have one dimension be uh, the pickup time, because I'm gonna use that for some of my queries, and the other one, the pickup location ID. Um, I'll simply define the domains to be very large, because again, there's, there's some, some miscellaneous uh, rows in this data. Uh, we won't care about pruning and cleaning uh, as much as just getting it loaded for this example. Um, I'm going to use the Hilbert, Hilbert order for everything, so I will not define a tile capacity here. Um, of course, I'm going to define it as, a, as a, a daytime and the filter to ZSTD. Same thing for the pickup location, we're using Hilbert, um, so I'm just going to uh, leave that in ZSTD. I'll define a number of attributes based off the fields. Um, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list here, but we have a you know a large permutation which you can support all the different um, data types, variable length, nullable. Everything works uh, on the open source side works with TileDB Cloud here. So we'll define the array to, the array itself. Um, next, I'm going to list the data from the actual uh, New York City taxi data. So we're going to use the raw New York City um, trip data here. We we haven't converted this customly. We're using the raw CSV files. These are publicly accessible. Um, so anyone can uh, can use this and go through. So this is just a basic helper function that will list the bucket using our VFS API once again to list it, um, and then break out the file names to match it with the particular schemas that exist. 
So if we go ahead and uh, look at, uh, we'll create the array and then we'll get the list of files. Let's actually look at building out the, uh, the task graph here. So the first thing that we do is just a nice function. We're gonna loop over all those files that we just found. We have them broken out by schema. Uh, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna simply then just call a delayed object for each one of our ingester functions based off the type. So this is just a simple loop that we're gonna go through to match the file to the, uh, the ingestion. But the important thing is we're building this out as a delayed object. So this is not gonna run live. This is just building this as part of our, our task graph API. Um, we will then um, build everything out into a nice hierarchy to show, uh, to show what it looks like. Let me show the visualization real quick. Of course, we'll list out the files and their different file sizes. So the important thing to note here is these CSVs, they are not, they are not that small. You know, they're all around half a gig to a gig in size. So this is a decent sized data set um, that we're going to load in parallel here um, pretty rapidly with, with our task graphs. Um, there is a couple files that are relatively small. Um, you guys can probably guess that's uh, when the pandemic started and the taxi trips fell off quite drastically uh, uh, in April um, of that year. So we built out this task graph in a nice, uh, a nice fashion here. Now, one thing I want to note is we built this out ingesting it on a per year basis. Um, and we did that because of limitations with Amazon S3. TileDB is actually so efficient at storing the data that if we tried to ingest all 54 files uh, concurrently, um, we actually run into some S3 uh, uh, slowdown limitations because we can actually store the data so fast and in such little time that S3 uh, has some uh, constraints. Also, we have constraints on reading the CSV files. The data is in some open buckets and in a similar manner, as fast as we can read the data, we store the data entirely to be super efficient here. So we throttle ourselves a little bit by running it on a per year basis. Um, you can see we've got about 55 uh, CSV files we're gonna load in parallel here. Now we, could, uh, we can call summary.compute to, uh, to start the graph. Um, or we can also run it asynchronously. So I'm gonna run it asynchronously so we can watch the visualizations. We can actually show the querying as it happens live. So some of the nodes are already finishing um, from loading some of this data. And if we go ahead and uh, open up the non-empty domain, we can see some of the data is starting to come into the system. Um, and if we run it a couple of times, we'll see that as the CSVs finish, the, uh, the actual domains um, will, uh, will change over time. So let's look and watch for, for another one and then you can see it live. Now, one of the important things to note here is that TileDB is completely uh, multi-reader, multi-writer friendly. And that includes using TileDB Cloud. So as, as fast as we're ingesting this data, you can actually also query it live. So you don't have to wait for the entire ingestion to finish. You can start uh, QA in the data. You can start looking at different chunks. You can start uh, watching uh, different things that happened. All right, we had one complete here. So if we run these, uh, this again, um, we'll see a slightly different non-empty domain compared to, uh, to before. Well, the data that loaded, this might be uh, some of the, the bad data in the system, so we're not quite seeing a difference. Um, but as much as, well, you can see how fast this is completing now. So we're using the chunked buffer and then it all runs to completion here. So everything will run in the system uh, live. And again, multi-reader, multi-writer. So you can run SQL queries at the same time. You can query from R, you could run it with, uh, with uh, Spark or something on the back end. You have complete flexibility. Now, in addition to querying everything right from the notebooks, I want to uh, I want to also show that you can actually share. Um, sorry, you can actually query live uh, even from your laptop. Um, you don't just have to be in the notebook environment. So I have a Python shell here. If I import TileDB um, and TileDB Cloud, I can um, open up the array. Um, we'll use one of our quick start arrays, um, for example, here, and you can query it live. And this is the exact same as what I just showed in the notebook, but I really would just want to highlight the flexibility that no matter what environment you're using, you can access all of this from the TileDB Cloud uh, arrays. We have helper functions for the authentication that are, that's needed when you're not in our environment. But if you have programmatic, uh, programmatic scripts that you're running in your own environment, you can use them to interact with TileDB Cloud uh, very easy and, and efficiently. So let's go back uh, to the website. And I want to highlight uh, the task details um, that we uh, that we just saw. So if we um, again, you know, of course, from a data management perspective, you can search for your task. You can see all the different types. If we query this um, to uh, some of our generic arrays um, that we just ran that complete it, um, let's take a look at what you actually can see here. So we have all the details about you know what was the memory used in the environment what were the cpus used what's the uh, the start uh, uh, the start time how much did it cost you can see this cost uh, a fraction of a penny not even a whole penny to to ingest this um, in this time 
you can get the actual function that was run here. So we see all the details of, uh, of the function, the full um, details. And you have also the logs and the output. So you can see here, you know, all the different timings. Um, as I say, you know, we printed out some logs specific, um, specifically so you could see that um, and see how, you know, literally how fast this, uh, this is uh, loading into TileDB um, very quick here. Now, in addition to just successful uh, arrays, if we actually take a look at some failed queries, I just want to highlight that we make it very easy for you also to see all the details about what went wrong um, in the log files. Just like we have the, the successful logs, the error messages, of course, if there are stack traces or outputs, you would see all of that detail uh, available for you too. We make it very easy for you not to have to dig through the different log files that are in the system, log into executor nodes or worker nodes to figure out where those logs are. They're, ret they're both returned directly to you live in the programming environment. And then of course, shown, uh, shown through the task uh, details uh, here. Um, so we've showed some of the serverless computations that's offered. We've showed you a little bit about the user-defined functions. Now I want to highlight a couple other functionalities and then finish off with, uh, with a brief overview of, of our ex public explore details. So in addition to the programming environment where you can actually run notebooks, we have the ability to display uh, Jupyter notebooks as TileDB arrays. So if, uh, if I actually launch a dashboard first, um, we can show you that in a live environment here, you can actually view the whole dashboard in an interactive fashion. So if you have uh, coworkers or end users that maybe aren't as, uh, aren't as sophisticated in the programmatic sense, and I don't wanna get into a notebook and see the actual code, you can render visualization outputs uh, live uh, in the system. And these outputs can be uh, three-dimensional outputs, they can be tabular outputs, here we have a nice example of a, uh, of a 3D rendering with our Babylon JS plugin um, of a LiDAR data set. So the, um, very easy, interactive, you can move it around, tons of flexibility here um, directly. Um, and you can, like I say, you can do uh, almost anything here. We'll, we'll walk through a couple more uh, dashboards in a second, but I wanna actually show you what this actual notebook looks like. So you can see the output here is just the visualization um, in, the, in the rendering. But if we actually go to the notebook and we pull up the dashboard, the dashboard, we can actually see the preview environment, what we're actually doing. So this is a, an actual Jupyter notebook um, with the code available here, but in the dashboard environment, of course, all the code is, is, is rendered. So, you know, we import it, uh, we open the array, we slice some, some details, um, and then we, uh, we just output our Babylon JS plugin. So any type of Jupyter um, plugin that produces output, whether it's a Pandas data frame, whether it's Babylon JS, whether it's a Mapbox GL plugins, anything can actually produce um, the full output uh, and render right here. And it's very easy to toggle whether a notebook is a dashboard or not. From the settings page, we have a very simple dashboard option where you can um, toggle whether this will present itself as a dashboard or not. So as you're working on things, you wanna create something for the end users. Once again, you can just uh, just toggle it, uh, toggle it here. So let's open up a couple, uh, a couple other uh, examples um, of the different functionality that we have in the system. Um, the first example that I'm going to show you is a, uh, a, no, a dashboard that actually has interactive input. So we use this uh, as a, an actual clinical example for a clinical use case that, uh, that one of our, uh, our users had. Um, and we allow you to actually have you know, an arbitrary amount of inputs and outputs, uh, and then you can render things live. So uh, in this case, it's a tool that does uh, genomic gene lookups that uh, maps uh, ensemble gene information across referencing with the OMIM. And you can give it you know, a genomic position, you can pick the genome version, uh, you can give it a gene, uh, you can require if things are not. So if I submit this, then we uh, on the back end we actually you know perform the queries that are required to do this, and then we render the uh, the tabular output um, that is here. Um, and again, you know, full flexibility. So if I wanted to switch this to uh, you know the the BRCA1 um, gene, um, you can do it, and then you can get all the details back. So you can have all different types of interactive input that you would like to have. Um, you know, again, 3D visualizations, tabular output, a lot of flexibility here. Now, this was all written in Python. So the last notebook that I want to highlight for you is actually a shiny dashboard um, that we have. So with our integrations that we have with JupyterLab, we actually built out some dashboard functionality to integrate JupyterLab uh, and shiny dashboards. So not only can you build Python notebooks, but uh, anyone that's familiar uh, in the R ecosystem has probably built, uh, built out dashboards. You can simply... Um, Build anything you'd like. We, here we have a complex shiny dashboard that will uh, that we that um, one of our uh, employees presented at the um, use our conference uh, a few months ago. 
So you can uh, render the results again um, in a tabular form. Uh, you can also render it, um, oh, sorry, actually I need to run a query. Uh, when you run the query, you can then render the results in you know, tabular form. If you want a data table like output, you can plot it uh, with the, uh, the numerous uh, shiny uh, plot plugins um, and you can go from there. So the sky is the limit about you know, what you wanna do, interactivity, uh, full shiny integration here, um, and a lot of advanced functionality that, uh, that can be built out of this system. So in addition to the, uh, the dashboards, uh, the last asset that we have in the system um, that we've rolled out recently is machine learning models. So with machine learning models, we actually let you store your machine learning model, whether it's in TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, or others, as a Tyler B array. So once again, we can store notebooks as arrays, we can store UDFs as arrays, and we can actually store machine learning models as arrays. We've built direct integration and plugins with, uh, with again, uh, some of the, uh, the most popular frameworks like TensorFlow here, where you can actually store your model as a Tyler B array. And one of the very nice things about this is you gain all of the functionality that we've gone over um, with the notebook. Of course, the, the, um, the data management aspects, the description, the hashtags, uh, the details, the sharing capabilities, the audit log capabilities, but also most importantly is the versioning support. Um, and we're gonna be rolling out uh, some UI tweaks soon to actually highlight the, the, the different versions in the UI over the next couple of weeks. But machine learning models, much like notebooks and UDFs and arrays themselves, uh, have the versioning baked into the underlying format. So as you train your model um, today and you make a change and then tomorrow you train your model again, you can actually very easily A-B test the model on predictions. You can use different versions of the model. What was it a month ago? What was it today? So as you're updating your machine learning models, all of that is baked into uh, the APIs that we have. And then also uh, will be baked in the UI uh, for visualizing that um, relatively soon. And the same thing goes true for notebooks. As you're updating a notebook and you're showing it over time, uh, you can go back in time either using the Jupyter Checkpoint system or uh, we're going to show the preview with the different versions uh, pretty soon in the UI, allowing you to update the notebook but always link to a specific version so users uh, have a consistent view of that. Of course, with machine learning models, uh, we have a dedicated preview um, based off the, the, the model type and the model integration showing the relevant details of what this model is. Um, we also have the model metadata uh, associated with this and any arbitrary metadata that you might store on the model, um, which is quite important in, in the machine learning uh, business. I should also note that we have integrations not just with machine learning models, but also with the different data set APIs. So you can perform very efficient near zero copy or zero copy in many cases um, training of the model or predictions of the model by storing your data in TileDB, storing your model in TileDB, and then you have seamless integration inside TensorFlow Pi towards Scikit-Learn to do your training uh, and go from there. Um, now, all of these functionalities that I've highlighted so far have been looking at the assets that you yourself own. But of course, TileDB Cloud is a collaborative environment. So we also have this explore page where you can view all the public data sets, notebooks, dashboards, UDFs, and machine learning models that are in the system. And this is available not just for uh, the, the, um, the SaaS product here, but also for enterprise uh, users uh, in your own environments, you have full control over the flexibility of when you wanna make things private, when you wanna share it with certain groups, when you wanna make it available to you know, organizations as a whole. And so this makes it super easy to come in here. You have all the same uh, functionality uh, around filtering, searching, exploring uh, in the system, looking through all the different examples. You have public notebooks uh, in the system that you can view. You have public uh, user-defined functions, public dashboards, and public machine learning models. So all of the examples that we've shown today, we will make available under this Explore tab and the various components uh, for you guys to view uh, later on uh, in the system. There is one final detail on the arrays that I want to highlight, a feature um, that is available to enterprise users, but is mostly available for the uh, for the SaaS product. Um, and we have some customers that we've been beta testing with uh, this with, and that is our pricing feature. So in TileDB Cloud, we have the ability to monetize your data and code in the system. So this means not only can you share your data and collaborate with others, but through our marketplace functionality, you can build out the entire, uh, an, an entire ecosystem of your own by selling your data right here in the platform. So we use Stripe on the back end for everything. Um, so assuming that you go through the steps of creating Stripe accounts and proving yourself that you're a real user and, all, and going through all of the security hassle that Stripe requires, uh, you can then easily monetize your data by simply click add pricing. Today we support two pricing types, but we're working uh, with customers to add additional options on this. And we'd love to hear feedback um, from what you guys see. 
but the pricing allows you to add a premium to the array itself. So with Tyler B Cloud, it's a pay-as-you-go model for basic access. We allow you to add a premium to your array so that users that want to access your arrays have to sign, have to agree to uh, the license terms that you uh, that you add, and then you can easily add a rate, uh, an egress rate. You know, if you want to say make it a dollar per gigabyte and say uh, you know. Uh, $10 per CPU per hour, uh, you can simply save that and then the pricing uh, would be added to the array and show up here. Um, for the sake of this uh, example that I'm on, I'm not gonna add it now. Um, but all of this is also available for the notebooks, for the user-defined functions, dashboards, and even machine learning models. The whole system is baked into it because once again, everything is stored as an array. So you inherit all the functionality um, directly in the system. So the last thing that I wanna highlight here is we've gone through a number of things, but as you're going to get in the system and start doing some exploration, you're probably wondering about what is the pricing structure? How does it look like? What are the details there? So I'm going to pull up my user profile um, where you can see all the details um, about it. On the invoicing tab, uh, we make it very easy for you to see all of the details about your invoice. Past invoices, current invoices, any payment uh, details that are on file. Every user gets $10 of free credit when they sign up. Now here, this is my personal bill. I'm up to about $192 uh, in usage for this month. But I want to highlight that almost all of my charge com comes from tasks charge. And if you look at the quantity, the number of seconds, uh, CPU seconds that I've used is about 75 days worth of CPU seconds. So I've used over, uh, over two months worth of, uh, of CPU time uh, for only $187. Now, of course, I haven't been running things for two months. With the massive parallelization that we have in Tile to be cloud, it's very easy for me to scale up and scale out uh, computations as much as I'd like. Um, and for the sake of, uh, uh, of things here, I, I use a lot. Um, but it's very easy for you to limit your concurrency and do all of that. But everything is updated uh, in near real time here. So not only can you view the charges on a particular task, you can easily monitor your invoice uh, live. Unlike other cloud vendors that make it very obtuse to see what your bill is and see the breakdown, we want to make it very easy for you to A, see the high level details and B, break down any particular task, uh, task graph or UDF or query that you've run to see those particular times uh, in the system. So it's very easy to go through that. Of course, in the user profile, we have all the other functionality to expect API tokens for uh, programmatic access, uh, profile where you can set your details, emails, uh, and whatnot, uh, time zone. And of course, we have um, TileDB Cloud uh, credentials. So TileDB lets you have your credentials um, for the different vendors, whether it's AWS, Azure, directly in the system. Uh, these are some demo ones that I put in the system uh, for this purpose. So you can actually see this. You can add a credential um, very easily, add your AWS, add a friendly name. Uh, and of course, this is how we facilitate all the underlying access uh, into the system. Um, with that, I think we've got a little bit more than 15 minutes. So I'm going to stop right now. Uh, we'll turn it over for QA. Uh, and like I said, during the QA, I'm happy to dive back into anything in particular that might have uh, might have come up. Great. Thanks, Seth. Um, cool. So we'll start off with this one. Uh, so. How do authors retain code ownership for custom UDFs? As, as far as this person can understand, uh, you, meaning TileDB, uh, but not the end user, still have access to the author's code? Yeah, this is a great question. So I'm going to share my screen again real quick just to highlight this. Um, when you register a UDF or notebook, it is stored in an S3 path. In this case, here's an example S3 path. Um, for, the, for the example that I registered during the webinar earlier. So this is a bucket that you as a user own uh, and retain full ownership of. TileDB only facilitates and manages the access to and from the bucket, but the data is always in your own bucket. So at any point you can, uh, you know, if you stop using the service or you want to access the, uh, the underlying code directly, uh, you can. And of course, on the open source side of the house with our uh, different APIs, we make it very easy to, uh, to query that uh, and use it even in a local environment. Um, so to, we govern the data we, and govern the code, but you retain full ownership of that. And of course, uh, you have the options for setting the different licensing. Um, in this case, I set it to MIT, but in the settings page, you can uh, change that to MIT, GPL, proprietary license, a custom one that you want to upload. Um, and then, of course, with sharing, you retain full ownership of all of that. Cool, thanks. Uh, so, uh, I think earlier, Seth, when you were showing the um, notebook previews, uh, this question came up for a little context. Uh, and if we don't have enough context, uh, please, 
this person um, submit another question and clarify it, but they ask, can you embed AR elements? I'm assuming that's augmented reality elements into the notebook previews, or perhaps I'm misunderstanding it, but um, turn over to you. Um, yes, feel free to, to clarify if, if AR, by AR you mean um, something else, but you have, uh, you have a lot of flexibility in the notebooks. Anything uh, that you can do in Jupyter, uh, you can do in the hosted notebooks here, and you can render as a dashboard. Um, so if you want to access, for instance, uh, 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 WebGL functionality, uh, you can easily do that. If you want to access uh, webcam functionality, um, you know, with the right plugins with Jupyter, um, everything runs in the user's browser. So there's a lot of flexibility there. So um, if, you know, we have a number of plugins pre-installed, um, if, if there's things that you're looking for, we're happy to, uh, to, to discuss and go into details and examples there. Cool. I'm going to move to this question just because it's a little related to the, the previous one. Um, is it possible to install something like Panel and use that to create simple web apps based on these notebooks with TileDB on, on the back end? I am not immediately familiar with Panel, um, but uh, by and large, yes. I mean, we we have integrations with Shiny, um, which you know integrates the R uh, directly uh, using the R kernel um, in our integrations to render it in Jupyter Lab. Um, so I'm I'm pretty confident that we can make uh, Panel work. Anything that runs that outputs, even if it's uh, has its own web server, um, it's very easy to iframe that into the dashboards. For instance, that's how Shiny works on the back end. Shiny runs its own server. We iframe that um, and. We have a manager to manage all the ports and everything there. Um, so happy to look into that and uh, discuss that further. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next one, um, on serverless compute, uh, do we get all of these features as part of TileDB Cloud Enterprise? Yeah, great question. And the answer is yes. Everything in TileDB Cloud Enterprise um, it's fully featured. Everything's available there. We don't rely on AWS lambdas. We don't rely on uh, 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 any Elastic Beanstalk or anything like that. We manage our own um, Lambda-like environment inside TileDB Cloud. Everything is self-contained, built by TileDB. We have uh, built into the, the product here. The Enterprise Edition deploys inside a Kubernetes cluster. Um, for the elastic scaling nature of that. Um, of course, the, the scaling has a lot of uh, permutations based off your use case, um, but everything's fully supported there. Thank you. So this, this next question is on um, using TileDB Cloud uh, with a different underlying persistent data store. So apart from object stored services like Amazon S3, um, can you use TileDB Cloud in conjunction with blob storage um, from NoSQL databases like uh, DynamoDB, MongoDB, et cetera? Yeah, this is a great question. So anything that implements the S3 uh, API, we are potentially compatible with. For instance, uh, we've, uh, we've tested with like Wasabi, with MinIO. Uh, we're interested in testing with uh, Cloudflare's new uh, R2 uh, environment they recently launched. Um, so anything that implements that or anything that implements a POSIX file system, um, including fuse mounts to, to various things, uh, we're potentially um, compatible with. The question usually always boils down to performance. Um, when you add uh, a number of uh, features, um, such as you know, an S3 compatible um, API on top of uh, other backends, uh, it always just comes down to uh, performance. But we have a lot of flexibility there. We're happy to discuss uh, additional use cases and, and dive into that. Thanks. So on data privacy, can uh, we support protections like GDPR and HIPAA for healthcare applications in TileDB Cloud? Yeah, great question. And yes, uh, we are GDPR compliant. Um, we also are HIPAA compliant and we've been going through uh, uh, SOC um, uh, validation. Um, and auditing, um, we've recently completed a, uh, uh, an external penetration test of actually the SaaS platform, came back with flying colors. Um, so we're, we're definitely uh, compliant there and working for getting uh, all the certifications that you might require in the various environments. Okay, a uh, couple more. Um, can the uh, dashboards alone be hosted uh, in any other portal apart from cloud.tileDB.com. Um, you know, perhaps there's a difference there with TileDB Cloud Enterprise versus TileDB Cloud, the SaaS, um, but I'll turn over to you. Yeah, you know, the dashboards are built to be integrated directly into the UI environment. 
Um, but of course, there is uh, there is some flexibility, especially on the enterprise side, about you know wh where things are displayed, what URLs you make things available, and the underlying file systems. Um, so there is some flexibility uh, offered there. Okay, uh, and then can you let us know about data versioning support that you provide? Yeah, so TileDB uh, embedded native to the open source software supports versioning uh, of the arrays. Um, and what that means is that every time you write to the TileDB array, a fragment is created. You can think of a fragment like a folder or a prefix. And so every time you write, we, we create these new folders or prefixes and they're immutable. So once the write is finished, it's there. And that is the underlying mechanism that facilitates the versioning and the time travel support for you to be able to look at the arrays over time. And of course, with that, we offer you know, various ways to consolidate your array and vacuum your array and you know, merge those fragments into one to remove um, past versions or, or purge them out. Uh, we have a lot of detail about that um, in the, uh, the TileDB embedded webinar. Um, and some example notebooks there, um, which I, I recommend you uh, take a look and we have some live examples of how all of that works. I don't see any more questions. So um, with that I'll you know, just like to wrap things up and say thank you Stavros and Seth. If you had any kind of final words, I'll turn it over to you first Stavros. Thank you, Mike. Nothing for me. Thank you very much for the questions, for attending the webinar. Uh, you can always reach out to us anytime by email. We're very responsive. So looking forward to seeing you again in, in the next webinar. Yep, I'd like to thank everybody for their time. Um, as we mentioned, we'll, we'll make things available uh, after this webinar. Everyone that uh, signs up for Tidal Cloud does get $10 in free credit. So feel free to sign up and you guys can, uh, can run through the, the same uh, examples uh, live uh, after the fact.